Thank you. Hola, Padua. Thank you for having me. I grew up in a cold place, Canada, uh, but nearly every summer uh, when I was a child, I would visit my grandparents who lived in Mumbai, India, which is a very hot and humid place. As soon as I'd step off that plane, I would wonder how anyone could live and work in such conditions. Now, to make things worse, my grandparents refused to get an air conditioner, no matter how much I asked them. You see, for them and generations of working and middle-class people around the world, an air conditioner was a luxury good, something for the wealthy and the privileged. But this is changing, and fast. Today, cooling systems, which include air conditioners, account for 17% of global electricity use. These systems also encompass the refrigeration systems that keep food safe from the farm to our grocery store. They also include the cooling systems that data centers use to make sure that you can post that all-important picture on Instagram or Facebook as fast as possible. But what makes this a burning question, what should alarm all of us, is that our energy use for cooling is expected to grow sixfold by the year 2050. Today, it accounts for about 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This growth that we expect to see by 2050 is, however, not going to be evenly distributed around the world. A recent uh, study that looked at this growth pattern from the International Energy Agency showed that most of the expected growth in our use for air conditioning and refrigeration systems is going to come from hot and tropical places in the world where people today don't use air conditioning and refrigeration systems as much as people in the developed world. So as you can see on this graph from the IEA, this includes countries like India, as well as other fast-growing countries like Indonesia and regions like the Middle East. And you'll also find Mexico on this plot. It's a relatively small fraction of the world's overall consumption of cooling, but there's expected to be significant growth here as well. But one of the most alarming things about climate change is that the warmer uh, our planet gets, the more we're going to need cooling systems, systems that are themselves large emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. This then has the potential to make air conditioning alone one of the single biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions by later this century. I was just in Delhi in India at a conference where a report was released that projected that residential air conditioning systems, the kind of systems you may have at home today, may account for half a degree Celsius in global warming by the end of the century. Just keep in mind that the UN Panel on Climate Change has set a target of two degrees Celsius warming over this century to make sure we don't experience really negative impacts. So 25% of that warming could come just from air conditioning systems. So my burning question really is, how can we keep cool, but do it in a sustainable way on a planet that is getting warmer? Now, I'm a scientist who studies light and heat, in particular how new kinds of materials can allow us to manipulate these basic aspects of nature in ways we might have once thought impossible. So while I always appreciated the value of a good air conditioner, I actually started working on this because of a bit of an intellectual puzzle that I came across many years ago. How were many ancient cultures able to have ice and make ice, even in desert climates? To answer this question, I'd like to take you to this building. It's what's known as a yakshal, or an ice house, that's located in the southwest of Iran. There are ruins of dozens of such structures throughout the Middle East, and evidence of many other ancient cultures making use of this kind of cooling approach, including very likely Mesoamerican and ancient Latin American civilizations as well. At the pool you see on the left, the people that you operated this ice house in winter months would pour water out into that flat pool. Now, even though the air temperature was usually well above freezing, the water would freeze. The generated ice would then be taken and used throughout the rest of the year by storing it in the building you see on the right. 
In fact, you may have experienced something very similar. If you've ever seen frost form on the ground, that's ice on the ground, even though the air temperature might be 5 degrees Celsius or even 10 degrees Celsius, so well above the air temperature. But wait, how did that water freeze if the air temperature was above freezing? Think about a pie that's cooling on a windowsill. For it to be able to cool down, its heat needs to flow to somewhere colder, namely the air that's surrounding here. But in this case, the air is actually warmer. So where did it go? As incredible as it sounds, the heat from that pool of water is actually going to the cold of outer space. How is this possible? Well, that pool of water at that ice house, like all natural materials, sends out its heat as light. This is a concept known as thermal radiation. So this is a basic fe feature of nature.、Uh, all objects will send out our heat、uh, as a form of light, and depending on your temperature, it's at a different part of the spectrum. For most of us right now, we're actually doing it right now at a part of the spectrum we can't see. It's called the infrared part of the spectrum. But you can visualize it with the thermal cameras that generate images like the ones I'm showing you right now. So what happens for that pool of water? Well, it's sending out its heat as this light upwards to the sky in the infrared part of the spectrum. Some of it is absorbed and sent back by the sky. That's the greenhouse effect. That's actually responsible for climate change. But here's the critical thing to understand. Some of that heat that's sent up as light effectively escapes through what's called a transmission window to outer space. I've plotted it here, and technical details aren't too important. But the main thing to understand is that some of that heat can actually escape through this window to space. So what happens? Well, that pool of water sends up its heat out to the sky, and it escapes some of it to a place that is much, much colder. Outer space, which sits at minus 270 degrees Celsius, so the pool of water effectively can then cool down because it's sending its heat out to somewhere that is much, much colder. So this is actually a well-known concept that's known as sky cooling or radiative cooling, and it's been well understood by climate scientists and meteorologi meteorologists for decades. When I came across this in about 2013, I was amazed by its simplicity as a cooling technology, but puzzled. Why aren't we using this to make cooling more efficient and solve this pressing problem we have? Well, it turned out there was one big problem, and it was the sun. You see, we need cooling the most in the middle of the day, and if you're going to be facing the sky, which you need to to en enable this passive cooling effect, you're going to see the sun. And most natural materials will heat up from the sun enough to completely counteract this cooling material. Think back to your own common experience. You've likely never seen something that's exposed to the sun that feels cool to the touch, right? So that's the main problem. But if we could enable it, we could actually have cooling in the middle of the day when we need it the most. Now, I went to my toolkit、uh, in a field that's called optics and photonics, and it really what it allows us to do is to design artificial materials that can interact with light in an unusual way. We designed something that I've labeled here a meta material, an artificial material whose uh, component uh, compounds and thicknesses、uh, allow it to exhibit very unusual behavior. So it did two critical things. First, it targeted that window to space in terms of sending its heat out, and importantly, it, it was also an extremely good reflector of sunlight. It reflected more than 97% of the sun's energy, and therefore should, in principle, be able to stay cold even in the middle of the day. So, how do you actually test this kind of thing? Well, it's one of the rare joys of working on this kind of topic. You don't have to do it in a lab; you actually get to do it outdoors. So, this is our very first experiment back in 2014,、uh, when I was a researcher at Stanford University in the U.S.、Um, And you know, when I did this test, I immediately knew work, it was working, and it was one of the most visceral and exciting experiences I've ever had as a scientist. How did I know it was working? Well, I just touched it, and it was cold to my touch. Just think about how counterintuitive that is. It's something for which the sun is shining on it, but it stays cold to the touch. In fact, this material and others like it will stay below the air temperature even in the hottest of summer days. In our first experiment, we showed it stayed about five degrees Celsius below the air temperature entirely passively. All we had to do was stick it outside. In fact, if we bring it into the shade. It warms up 
very counterintuitive. Now, one thing that I got really excited about when I started working on this was I realized that the method we were using to make these kinds of materials was already scalable and low cost. So there was an opportunity to not just do something really interesting scientifically, but to make it real and solve what is a very, very pressing problem. So we think the most direct way of using this technology to improve the efficiency of today's air conditioning and refrigeration systems is to use it as an efficiency boost for these conventional systems. To do this, we've built fluid cooling panels analogous to the solar water heaters you may have seen, and they're pictured right here, except they cool the water passively. These panels are then integrated with a component almost every air conditioner and refrigerator you know has, which is called a condenser. In doing so, we can actually improve the efficiency of the underlying system about 15%, which we've actually shown uh, in our first field trials last summer. We started a company called SkyCool Systems, which is actively commercializing this. And I'm very excited to tell you that we've just deployed our very first commercial pilot. It's only been four years since we did the very first experiments in a university setting, and it's been a remarkable journey to take it from the lab to its first commercial-scale deployment shown right here in Northern California on a convenience store. Now, what's really exciting as we look forward is that this technology, while right now it's an efficiency boost, might form the basis of an entirely passive approach to cooling, meaning you could have building systems for cooling that require no electricity at all. As a first step towards this, we've shown we can use this approach to stay as much as 42 degrees Celsius below the air temperature for no electricity or water input needed. So just imagine that, something that is below freezing on a hot summer's day, just by putting it outside and facing the sky. Now, as excited as I am about these potential commercial applications, as a scientist, I'm drawn to a more profound conclusion that this work is leading us towards. And that's that the cold of space represents a renewable energy resource that could improve the efficiency of any energy conversion process here on Earth. One example is solar cells. They are exposed to the sun and the sky, and they heat up. Because they heat up, they actually are less efficient out in the field than they are in lab tests. So this is a well-known problem with solar cells. We've shown that by better structuring the glass that's on the top surface of the cell, we can use this sky-cooling effect to keep the solar cell cooler, slightly cooler, and because of that, allow it to operate more efficiently. My lab is actually now pursuing a lot of interesting opportunities that are emerging from this, that include uh, applications in things like water conservation, power plant cooling systems, and beyond. Now, I've been talking a lot about cooling, and you might be wondering, well, that's great, but can we do something else with this? One thought that came to mind long ago for us was that this phenomenon was known even to ancient peoples to work very well at night. But solar cells don't work at night. Could we use this effect somehow to generate power at night when solar cells don't? And the answer is yes. Now, we're just starting on this. We've got a long way to go, so it's a very small amount of power we can generate. But it's enough to power an LED at night. And we call this generating light from darkness, the darkness of space itself. So, that's where this is all going. This is still the early days for all this kind of research. It's only been a few years, and so I'd encourage you all to keep your eyes peeled. But I'd like to conclude by pointing us uh, to what some broader takeaways that this all uh, tells us. First is that this ability to harness this cold resource of space is ultimately enabled by our ability to control this heat that surrounds all of us right now in the form of thermal radiation. With new kinds of materials, we may be able to harness this and bend it to our will in ways we might not have imagined possible. As we look forward to a future where we have to confront climate change, I believe having this ability in our toolkit will prove to be essential. So, the next time you walk outside, yes, Think and appreciate that the sun is essential to life on Earth itself. But don't forget 
that the rest of the sky has something to offer us as well. Thank you.